All right. Uh, well, I'm here with uh, Ryan Parker, and uh, we're going to be talking about his experience on the Camino de Santiago de Compostela. Yes. Uh, he walked the Camino Francaise, um, the most famous and most popular version of the Camino uh, earlier this year, he and his wife. And um, it's part of a series of interviews I'm doing and getting ready for my walk on the Camino next year for my 2019 sabbatical. A uh, much shorter walk than you did, an easier walk <laughs> than, than yeah. you did up the Portuguese route. But um, Ryan works in the film industry in Los Angeles. And I think we connected through our mutual love of binge watching. Yes. Because uh, yeah. I was doing the uh, the OA for Lent project with my friend. I still Ryan. think that's one of the coolest uh, faith and pop culture things I've seen in a long time. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. I appreciate it. The fact that you were you guys are interested in it meant a lot to us. Still yeah. 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 It's great. So we had done that project, and then you and Tony Jones do a podcast called Killer Serials, where you reflect theologically on streaming shows, like yeah, Gates yeah. Tales and, and others. And uh, so we we did an interview together about that project on your podcast, and then uh, I think I skyped into a class that you were teaching at one point, yeah, uh, to yeah. talk about that project as well. And uh, we've just stayed in this kind of digital way. We've never met in person, but we've stayed yeah, yeah. in with the mutual. Uh, Appreciation and interest. I just I just talked about that with someone in an interview earlier today when somebody said, "How do you do the work?" Like, because we do some marketing stuff and we are interacting with influencers and pastors like yourself and different things. And I said, "It's I've I've had hundreds of conversations with people that I've never met that you know <laughs> then we may meet at a junket two years later and we feel like we know each other, but we've you know that's less and less weird though, isn't it? Like in our connected world, it's yeah, much." I'm I'm friends. I mean, I wrote a <laughs> my first book. I yeah. wrote Elizabeth Drescher. We didn't meet in person until the book was almost done. That's right. And that yeah. was, you know, that was. And she and I were in school together. Well, she was she was teaching at the GT at uh, CDSP oh, when okay. I was at the GTU. So I knew her. Oh, wow. and that's how I became aware of your work years ago. Oh, was wow. uh, through her. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow! It's a small digital world. It yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Well, everybody should uh, check out your podcast with Tony Killer. Yeah, thanks. Podcast. And then also your website, Pop Theology, right? Yes. Which is a really great thinking. Don't, of if you want to mine some things, don't look for anything new. It's been on, hi <laughs> on hi as we say in the industry, on hiatus. But <laughs> That's right. Well, we hopefully it'll about, come back. Yeah. We were just talking about projects that uh, get started and then uh, they're on sabbatical or something. Yeah, I have a few projects like that yeah. at the moment too. But if it's new to you, then... Uh, or new to to people who are watching, then uh, yeah, out. yeah, it's yeah, cool. that's true. Yeah. Um, well, we're going to talk about the Camino today, and um, so Ryan, I'd just love to kind of ask you. I've had this uh, kind of burning kind of thing to do the Camino for a while. I'm not exactly even sure when it started, but I've had this thing about yeah. it. And so when the sabbatical came up, and we thought Spain might be kind of the epicenter of what's going to happen in this experience, I thought this is my chance to mm -hmm. do it. Um, so what drew you to the Camino? Yeah, that's a good question. I feel like you a little bit. I, my wife and I, Amy, uh, walked together and we can't identify when we first started talking about like, this is something we'll do. I think she recalls uh, in 2012, we took the year off and traveled around the world. And she recalls meeting p various people on that trip who had done that wow. and said that was something we should look into. Um, it had always been kind of on our radar, I think, since then. And then last year, I was involved producing and marketing a film called I'll Push You, mm. uh, which if you haven't seen that, mm. I, I, oh, tonight. I don't know what you're doing tonight. <laughs> I, I, now, I now know what you're doing tonight. You're going to go rent or buy a film called I'll Push You, and it's a documentary based on two gentlemen who walked the Camino, one of whom was in a wheelchair and his friend pushed him the entire 500 miles across the Camino. Wow. And it is a stunning film. It is, uh, it's one that feels like we need it now um, because mm. it's about friendship and service and sacrifice mm. and being part of that process and that, um, that film and even in a small way. Uh, and while I was working on that, my wife was in grad school at UCLA in the midst of a two year program. And I said, when you finish school, we're going to go walk the Camino because the film had had such an impact on me. And, uh, and then earlier this year, my father passed away. And then in the summer, Amy graduated. And it was just the perfect storm of like needing to disconnect 
mm. and the timing being absolutely perfect. Mm. So I think there wasn't really one reason I think we cited as we, as we prepared to go that we wanted to take that time to kind of connect with one another, reconnect with one another. Um, we love to travel. We love to meet new people when we travel. Mm. We feel like that's kind of a, um, as not to sound too like egotistical, but we feel like we're trying to be diplomats for mm. ambassadors for, um, I don't know, for goodwill, if you, if you will, mm -hmm. especially now, like America's getting, we don't have a good reputation abroad. Uh, yeah. if you're not aware of that, <laughs> but, um, in our own small way, we try to go and be hospitable and loving and, you know, uh, interested in learning about people and, so I think those were our reasons. I don't know, you know, a lot of people go because they have, uh, we met people on the Camino for every person we met, they had a different reason about, you know, why mm. they were there. Mm. And mm -hmm. um, for us, I don't know that we had one reason, but I think it was to kind of reconnect, breathe a little bit yeah. after kind of a chaotic two years. Mm. Um, and then of course, along the way, we have these conversations that you know, we're trying to figure out what's the next chapter of our life and these things. And that would just gave us the opportunity to do that. So, wow. yeah, wow. I think that's it. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. I think like there's, um, there's like, you know, the like timing is an important thing with the, it yeah. seems like in the, with the Camino that like there's a, kind of an element of the timing works, the timing's right. I've got a sabbatical. You, you know, she graduated and, mm -hmm. um, but it's somehow like there's some element to it of the Camino that it like, it finds you. <laughs> like that's mm -hmm. like the impression I'm getting when I do these interviews. Like 100%. way more to the timing than just happenstance. Yeah. And I feel like, and, it, and the more you read about it and you read people who write, and we'll talk about this later, but people who chronicle their journey, there is this sense. And even now I feel a little bit of it about wanting to go back because I feel like maybe there's more. You know, I don't, I don't feel like I it was exhausted by any means, mm -hmm. but you know, one of the things that was interesting in pe people that we, in speaking of reasons for going, it, it obviously has a rich religious history, but we we encountered so many people, I think probably more than half and maybe way more than half of the people who are on the Camino wouldn't identify as religious huh. Huh. anymore that uh, now they may say there's a spiritual reason that they're there, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you know, to be uh, kind of blunt about it, like to be human is to be spiritual. Like they're, you know, but like as a religious pilgrimage, I, I think it's a very low percentage of people who hmm. go uh, for that anymore. So, so that's uh, interesting because that really connects with the theme of my sabbatical, thinking about thinking about like the coexistence of kind of interfaith identity and affiliation like within my family but really the the bigger picture of that um like in thinking about it for my church is you know we see the, like the american religious landscape is changing so dramatically with the rise of the nuns mm -hmm. who don't affiliate or people who are spiritual but not religious um, there's a lot of good literature coming out on that um and i think that's one of the huge things that congregations have to grapple with right mm -hmm. so it's not just that people don't come to church like they used to actually like people's faith lives are, are maybe changing or shifting or being expressed in really different and interesting ways. Yeah. Yeah. How to be able to hear, listen for that, I guess. I had my, I had a conversation with my pastor about this yesterday who said, you know, uh, he makes this case and I'm probably going to butcher his plans, but he, he said, uh, you know, liturgy is technology. Mm. and uh, the traditional liturgies of the church are outdated technologies. And he's trying to think, what are the new liturgies? What are the new technologies? Uh, or maybe maybe the tech, the liturgies that need to be reintroduced. And he thinks pilgrimage is one of those, mm. that, that families are taking pilgrimages all the time, but yeah. they, uh, Disneyland, <laughs> right. hunting trips, right? But yeah. they're often, those, those pilgrimages are often about, uh, fostering a spirit of consumer capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, whereas a old, like traditional pilgrimages are about letting go and releasing those things. Yeah. And that maybe there's a way in which we can reintroduce pilgrimage, tr intentional travel as a, as a liturgy, right? Or as a new technology in the life of the church. Wow. Um, 
so he he's been thinking about some of that stuff too and then maybe leading a trip leading a pilgrimage yes. soon. yeah yeah cool so like yeah so like this is my kind of theory like the impulse is the same like there's an imp like a, a pilgrimage impulse right of some kind but i mean in some ways and pilgrimage has just been there as long as the church has been around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, but it's not something that, like, at least in Protestant circles, we lift up that much. But, like, so, you know, I can think of, I can think of a bunch of families from our church that have done a pilgrimage this year to Disney yeah. World or, or yeah, yeah, to, yeah. Uh, Yellowstone or some other place, but we don't call it that. Mm -mm. And we don't, yeah. listen, we don't listen with spiritual ears or, or in our conversations be able to connect the spiritual dots of that. Yeah. So, so for me, it's sort of like, how do like, I, and I, now that you say it, it's perfectly clear, but of course I didn't recognize that before. So how do we listen and look for those things and connect with people about that? So it's, I think part of the danger of a sabbatical and the kind of sabbatical we're going to take with all this travel is that it's something that a pastor does, or it's like a very spiritual thing, or you have to go to the Camino to experience it. You know, um, you have to get on a plane when you can experience pilgrimage right in your neighborhood if you if you wanted to or at a labyrinth or whatever well and the other danger that is because you read so many accounts of people who take pilgrimage and talk about the way it transformed their lives and how for a long time in the history of pilgrimage to return from a pilgrimage is to come back enlightened and with answers and i don't know that we came back with more enlightened than when we left because i don't know that we're done processing the, the whole experience and i would imagine that for a religious professional, like a pastor or someone, that that expectation may be even higher. Yes, right. Which yeah. is kind of commodifying the experience, right? Because it's like a results-based practice. <laughs> and I don't know that that's exactly, you can't come back and say, well, I don't know what the outcome was. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've got a, rep I got a report due on this thing and I got to say something, but <laughs> man, I don't know. Right. But it's going to be uh I mean, to recognize that whatever that is, is provisional, right? Like that, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the moment. And then I took a sabbatical in uh, 2008 and uh, my last church and I didn't have a grant or anything. It was like super low key. My wife was pregnant with twins. Um, and so we went to PEI in Nova Scotia in our minivan, you know, on the ferry. And yeah. we were just at her family's cottage the rest of the time. But I did all of this journaling and reading and thinking about um, finding God in everyday life, you know, like uh, changing the diapers and washing the dishes and, you know, being at home and, uh, and kind of finding God in the midst of parenting. Um, and like, I'm still learning from that experience. Like I'm still using a lot of the tools. Um, it certainly changed me personally in the way that I kind of think about the intersection of faith and life for myself. But I use a lot of those resources and tools that I, I either discovered or created even now in my ministry 10 years later, but I think I'm still figuring I'm, st I'm and, and I'm, even so I'm still like unpacking what that experience was like for me. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, so I wanted to ask you about, um, documenting your time, uh, on the Camino cause mm -hmm. I thought that was so cool. Cause I was following you on Instagram and what I, and I, what I noticed was like at the end of each day, it seemed that mm -hmm. you posted like a handful of pictures and then a short kind of summary of where you went or something yeah. you did, but there was nothing very long form about it. It was just a snapshot at the end of the day. And as I think about heading off to sabbatical, there's kind of like, I need to disconnect, um, mm -hmm. you know, from everything, yeah. but, but also want to, you know, help people follow along without getting drawn into all the social media stuff. But how did you decide on that approach and how did it work for you? Yeah, that's a good question. I think the, the struggle I had is because, because I, the type of work that I do or that my company does that I work for is it can be done anywhere. And I think there was an impetus like to say, or at least I felt like I could still be plugged in a little bit. Mm -hmm. And if I can help, I, I'd like to, or, or whatever, we were in the midst of some campaigns on some films and, you know, the guy that I worked close, closely with was like, you can just shut off everything <laughs> and, you know, just leave this behind and go. And, um, and I was very grateful for that. And so I, I minimized uh, compared to kind of the normal day to day. There was very little work, um, which I was thankful for. And then there, but the, 
the, the next question was, well, how am I going, because everybody asked, well, how are you going to document your trip? And I <laughs> thought, well, first off, why do I have to? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then another person said, um, you really need to, because you're going to be thank you will be thankful that you did because it will help recall the experience and chronicle uh, because it, and I'll say more about this later. It, the days run together mm. so quickly. Mm. Um, and it was, and so I thought, well, I don't want to blog about it. And I'm so thankful that I didn't mm. because you're just exhausted at the end of the day and have to think to sit down and like some days you can't even think straight mm. because you're so tired. Mm. Some days you want to go have dinner with someone you just met and that dinner may turn into drinks and you don't want to be like, well, I've got to go back home and write a blog about it. <laughs> what I should be doing, which is having a, you know, these experiences. Yeah. And then I knew that, and I knew that we had family who, who wanted to follow along in any way that they could. And it was almost by accident to, uh, that I was like, Oh, Instagram has that 10 picture limit. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what I'll do? I'll, at the end of every day, I'll try to find the 10 photos that kind of capture this feel of the day mm -hmm. and, and do that and do just a quick, where did we go and how far? And after the first couple of days, I thought, oh, this is all I need to do. And of course, we would journal some along the way, but it, it really also forced to like think of, like as we were taking pictures of everything, just to be thankful, uh, be thoughtful about the moments that we were in hmm. of like, why is this important? Or why, what about this has captured my attention today? Hmm. And and then really going back and saying, all right, what, what was emblematic of the day? What, you know, what captured that spirit? And it turned out to be like really easy. Now there were some nights, where <laughs> some nights we would lay down in bed and I'd fall asleep and wake up five minutes later and go, Oh, I didn't post 10 pictures. You know, <laughs> my mom's going to freak out. Like, we're, <laughs> did, did we make it? You know? Um, and then some days I'd wake up and be like the next morning would wake up and, say oh i didn't post let me just throw these up there and mm. um but yeah i found that to be a very uh, i th i think there may be a time where we go back and revisit photos and those experiences to maybe do something more long form i, I think there's a space for um uh how do i say this um i think the camino can be great for couples mm. and i think there there might be some some work to be done around the way in which Camino and pilgrimage can be something for couples to yeah. engage in and reflect on. Because I, I felt like I started writing down all these chapter titles for <laughs> like the first two weeks of like things I was learning about myself and like uh, us as a couple. And yeah. then I stopped, which <laughs> is probably another chapter. Like what, you know, uh, <laughs> this is not sustainable. I don't know. But uh I think we're yeah, I, the same way. Never. Yeah, ever. there's more. There's more. Uh, I think there's some more. Could be some really cool work done there. But um, in terms oh, of yeah. chronicling, it was it was kind of an accident, and it was something that it was a happy accident to say, "Oh, this will be sufficient for yeah. what we're doing." I love the reflective nature of that too. Is you're just looking back on your day. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, you know, most of the things that I've ever read about the the Camino or pilgrimage, it's you, you say like there's this expectation of like enlightenment at the end, but it's almost always a portrayed as a solitary journey yes like, I'm, by and large like I yes mean, the books i'm the paul Cohello book or um joyce rupp's book or uh, it's you know you're with other people the canterbury tales would be different but you know um but by and large you just like a solitary journey of enlightenment is kind of how it's portrayed yeah and i think uh before i left you know my pastor was like hey i want you to kind of keep in the back of your mind this notion like the idea that we might do this we might open this up in the future and take a group from our church. Mm. And I was like, okay, yeah, I'll think about that. And, and did, uh, and talked with my wife as we walked and she was like, I don't think this is for groups at all. Uh -huh. uh, I, I disagree slightly. Um, I think if everybody's kind of has a clear understanding of the physical implications and if everybody as much as possible is on the same page mm. uh, and you keep it at a manage manageable number, I think, I think it can be a group activity. Mm -hmm. I, t I, her point, I, I totally understand where she's coming from, especially from the logistics side. But um, yeah, I think a couple experiences, we saw, we saw so many people walking alone mm -hmm. and you're never, 
you're rarely alone alone. Like there are always people that you're coming up against. Either they're walking past you or you walk past them and there is exchange. Um, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of solo pilgrims. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things we were talking about just before we started recording um, that I wanted to be sure to actually, we started recording because I wanted to capture this um, was thinking about um, religion, the, the role of religion. So, a big theme of this my sabbatical is interfaith identity and relationship um, with my wife being Jewish and um, thinking about this kind of time in the Middle Ages in Spain, you know, this kind of, in some ways, ideal, very true, but idealized time where you had Jews, Christians, and Muslims all living together um, in kind of fascinating, I'm reading about it now, right? Like really fascinating cultural and religious influence on one another. Um, but there's a dark history too. And um, being kind of Lutheran and Jewish, you know, I recognize the tension of that really powerfully that in World War II, <laughs> you know, Lutherans, <laughs> Lutheran Germans <laughs> were involved in, you know, my wife's a Pol descended from Polish Jews. Yeah. So, um, so we live this tension. So it's not only about kind of the kind of gifts of interfaith understanding, but it's really recognizing the tensions too. And I, you were saying the Camino, and I've read a little tiny bit of this. The Camino has a has a kind of tough history around that too. Yeah, yeah. Could you say more about? Oh, that? yeah, for sure. So that is a. It was fairly early in the Camino. I don't know, maybe week and a half or two weeks in, that I realized uh, there's a lot of white people on this thing. There's not there. I would say it's mostly European American. Um, by far, I think percentages of people who walk the Camino, um, South Americans, uh, Latino Americans, some, um, quite a few South Koreans, hmm. not a lot of black or brown people. Okay. And I started thinking about that. And there is a troubling history in Spain, as you've uh, mentioned. Mm -hmm. And there, there, I think there is a way in which you can conceive of the Camino as a very anti-Muslim practice uh, mm -hmm. journey. Because uh, many of the churches there have images of saints or, um, you know, kind of quote unquote heroes of the faith who are literally beheading Muslims. Mm. Right. And on in the statue, right. Or their foot is uh, in a triumphant pose. They're like squashing the, mm. the, the, their version of the infidel. So I, um, uh, the, it, the pilgrim, the pilgrimage as, um, as a religious and economic reality, uh, is something that you also have to wrestle with as well. Mm. Um, the, it's history is not simply an idealized spiritual journey where yeah. you go and gain, enlightenment and uh, I think you just have to hold those intention uh, also from the like even from the food like what what food is popular in Spain hmm. um, probably has some problematic origins so I think um, it was it was a tension we had to hold that intention and to know that it's also a deeply Catholic practice um, in the history of the Catholic Church most of the, I mean the churches you go in are Catholic churches and the Trump and the drama and turmoil there and, and holding that intention now. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was just, I don't, I don't have any answers or explanations other than the fact that it was something that we were aware of that we talked about. And I don't know, it was, it was just on our mind is for every opportunity we had of experiencing this great beauty or having this moment for reflection and connection. You know, there was, there were times we were like, yeah, but you know, there, it's that kind of yeah, but that um, I think we should all try to be aware of. Yeah, um, I mean, even at one point, like Saint James of Santiago was uh, portrayed as the Moor Slayer, right? He, it, it was like Saint James the Moor Slayer. So he, Saint James, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, I think my image is for. Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's right. It's, um, what are we, uh, what are we celebrating? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's going to be interesting. Part of the trip for us is the, I mean, it's just the perfect kind of landscape for us to explore that, the, the kind of the gifts and the tension. Yeah. Um, with, the, you know, with the Spanish Inquisition too and everything. Yeah. Um, as well. Um, so could I ask you, want to ask you about your, um, you know, what was the kind of your daily experience like? And I should say like, whereas I'm walking the Portuguese route for 11 days. You walked for how many days? Was it 40 or more? 40. Uh, well, the whole trip took 42 days. 42 so days. we took, we took maybe five days. I can't remember exactly how many days off. So mm -hmm. um, I kind of wish we could, I kind of hit that 40 number just for <laughs> the biblical implications, but uh, 42, we probably took an extra, we probably did take one to two days off that we really didn't need, but I don't regret any of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you are taking probably the second most popular route. Mm -hmm. And what a lot of people don't understand is that there are many Caminos, right? There are many ways to get to yeah. Santiago. Yes. And people travel many of those. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, the Frances is the most popular. Um, the Porto route is a little bit shorter. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to deal with the Pyrenees. But I think beyond those things, your experience will be the same. And from mm -hmm. people who we met, uh, one, one gentleman that we walked with quite a bit towards the end had done the Porto route uh, last year and mentioned how it was similar to the route that we were currently walking. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the day to day is you wake up and we started, we would wake up earlier and earlier. I think mm -hmm. we usually got up around six, maybe a little before a little after uh, and as our, the time of year that we were there, it was, we were walking for about an hour in the dark, oh. uh, which is amazing. <laughs> uh, and, but we wake up, have some sort of breakfast. If there was breakfast at hand, if not, we would walk to the next village and eat something. And then we'd walk for a couple hours, stop for lunch, um, walk for a couple hours, take a rest. Um, depending on kind of the strenuous, how strenuous the walk was that day, given mm -hmm. altitude or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think all told, the, our, our day was about a seven to eight hour day, wow. walking about five hours of that okay. and resting, the, eating and resting the, for the remainder of the time. Yeah. Um, depending on where you stay, most places, don't allow you to check in until about two or three. Hmm. Um, we can say something, I can say something about accommodations, but uh, yeah. depending on the type of accommodation you had um, there, sometimes you could stay at a monastery or a convent for free. Hmm. If so, you needed to be there early to hmm. wait in line to get your bed. Um, obviously if you had booked a room or a bed somewhere else, you could just check in at your, at your leisure, but mm -hmm. um, usually check in, take a shower, grab a beer, take a nap maybe or read or whatever dinner is like six or seven. Um, and this was what was a surprise for us is that pil we had read a little bit about them, but not in any detail, but pilgrim meals are very popular for dinner hmm. and it's a three course meal with a bottle of wine for about 12 bucks oh, every wow. night. Wow. And you just, you're like, I guess I'll go have the pilgrim meal tonight. And <laughs> Uh, usually eat, visit with some folks, and then it is, it's usually an early night. I mean, I think for us, it was always in really by 9 or 9.30, asleep by 10, mm. you know, 10 or 10.30. And, and you kind of do that over and over. I mean, yeah. uh, the, the, uh, um, the number of stops may change. Um, obviously, the locations are different, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot of coffees in the morning, <laughs> a lot of tortillas. <laughs> which are the egg. I, I, you know, I the, living in LA, you say tortilla and you think it's what I wrap my taco in. Oh, yeah. But Spanish tortilla is like an, it's like a quiche, okay. a lot of egg and potato, a lot, <laughs> ate a lot of those. Um, but it was good. I mean, the walk itself was like I said, some days it was, it felt like it took it, took everything out of you. <laughs> some days were shorter and, you know, we could get into a, city or a town and go look at churches or museums or whatever. Um, but that really was kind of the, it's just a lot of walking. <laughs> it's just a lot of walking. Um, and our bodies, I mean, I was amazed at how I'm not a super athletic person at all. I mean, I, 
I like beer a lot, but uh, and that's why I go to the gym. But um, I am not someone who likes to train or, you know, like I don't try to lift more weights and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I was amazed at how quickly our bodies would bounce back huh. from. I mean, we would get there's a there's a priest who wrote a book about walking the Camino. And he said, you know, at the end of the day, it feels like when you get in, it feels like somebody had your feet and just pounded the bottom of them with a, a meat tenderizer. <laughs> and I 100% agree with that uh, <laughs> comparison. But you know what was we found every day? There's nothing that like a glass of wine and sleep couldn't cure. Because we mm -hmm. would wake up the next morning and be like, you know, a little stiff, right? Stretch it out a little bit. Yeah. But then you're right back at it. And huh. it's just how resilient you can, your body is. And, hmm. um, you know, we had a couple of no injuries, thankfully, a hmm. uh, couple of blisters here and there, but nothing serious. Um, yeah. we met some people, we met a gentleman who had been dreaming of walking the Camino for like 20 years or something, hmm. you know, and he had to go home halfway through because he hurt his foot. Oh. And, you know, so there were, there were people who had to check out because of injury, yeah. but, um, I don't think that the day to day of walking every day, um, we saw people, we saw eight to 80, like of mm. all ages, all sizes, all health, you mm. know? Mm. Um, so it's, it's, it's very doable. Yeah. 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 Oh, oh, cool. Hmm. Oh, I'm, can't, I'm getting more excited by the moment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, We've been saying kind of uh, debunking the um, kind of moment of enlightenment pilgrimage thing, but um, yeah, do you like in these early, early days uh, following the Camino, you have just a, a general um, takeaway or feeling about it or, yeah, um, you know, not some kind of eureka moment, but kind of where you are with it, maybe the, the gift of it for you at this point? Yeah, that's a good question. I think the... Um, somebody said, Oh, are you enlightened or something? And I said, you know, it only reaffirms my hunch that we all know the answers, <laughs> right? We know, yeah. we know how to live. We do like, we know, we know that the hi hyper consumer culture in which we live is not sustainable. It's not fulfilling. Mm -hmm. um, we know that the way that we consume is hurting the planet. We know, I mean, mo most of us know this some of us tonight. <laughs> Uh, but we know that chasing money is, is pointless. Um, and I, and this is part of a larger conversation that I think my wife and I have been having before and, and continue to have about how we want to live our life and where we want to live our life. Hmm. Um, the other, although we were never completely disconnected, um, which I'd say on the Camino, you can be, if you want to be, hmm. um, but we we consumed social media far less than we normally do. Mm -hmm. You know, I was on email far less than I normally am. Mm -hmm. um, and I got to tell you, life is better. <laughs> As someone, I, and, and I don't know that uh, I have, again, I don't have the answer. And, I, and I'm particularly interested to talk to you about this because of the research that you've done. Mm. But I... Um, also on the on the tail end of um, walking the Camino, I read Yuval Noah Harari's book *Sapiens*. Have you read this book? No. Oh, mm -hmm. put it on your list. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Should be required reading for all people of faith. Mm -hmm. It is. It blew my mind, and I I don't know that our species is equipped to. Uh, I don't know that we're equipped for social media long-term. Mm. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we're, this is how we're designed yeah. or how, how we have evolved. I don't think it's, I don't think it's the answer. I don't think, I think that, I think ultimately it will do more harm than good. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe there's some short-term benefits, but I think overall I, I fear uh, that it, it will be, that it's problematic. And part of that was because like we walked through, the beauty of at least the, our path is that we went through a handful of big cities. So Portugal, uh, Burgos, Leon, um, 
and then obviously you get in Santiago. And this, I don't know if this is a larger European thing because uh, my business partner and I noticed this in Rome when we were there earlier in the year for work. Mm-hmm. We would be out at bars at night at the end of the day and we would look around and most people weren't on their cell phone, cell phones. They were not? No, no. Mm-hmm. But like small percentage of people sitting, like you go to a bar here in LA, everybody's on their phone nonstop. Yeah. Right. Either they're taking pictures, they're looking at Twitter or whatever. They're yeah. checking email. We were at bars and we'd look around and everybody, young people <laughs> talking to each other. Yeah. Like phones were away. Didn't even see them on the table. <laughs> I mean, it was so, it was so pronounced. I mean, it was noticeable. Wow. Um, but in, and we felt, um, Amy and I felt a little bit the same in those bigger cities in Spain. Uh, but beyond that, you also walk through very small kind of one horse towns that have a church, <laughs> uh, a hotel or a hostel, <laughs> a restaurant, and that's about it. And we started wondering about people that live there. Like, what do they do? And what's their day to day life like? Yeah. And, you know, the assump- I mean, our assumption was maybe they're not as plugged in as we are. Mm-hmm. Is their life any less full than ours? Like, right. because they're, they're not like tweeting about me too and time's up and which those things are necessary. And I'm thankful for those movements, but I, I wonder if the, the effect that these, that these modes of connection are having on us mm-hmm. and, yeah. I don't know. I'm yeah, no, I, I, um, it's all I've been thinking about since I've been back. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah, it's, uh, we've been working on a new young adult ministry project here at church. We got a Lily grant to, um, jumpstart a project and it's been a year and a half of conceiving dreaming. And now we're starting to do it. And the biggest aha moment for me was because I imagine 20 somethings as very social and very connected and stuff and the key kind of pain point or pressure point or thing that we felt called to address is this uh, culture of loneliness that you know it yeah. just it, it seems like the most connected generation in the history of the world is the most lonely yeah and um and then I remembered, you know, a pastor friend of mine who's at a Mission Start church kind of talking about how he had all these young adults at his Mission Start and kind of his job was to help them have face-to-face relationships, <laughs> like to kind yeah. of them and doing that. And, uh, and it's, you know, not just young adults, of course, it's, uh, it's everybody, but that to me was just the hit me over the head moment. Um, and I think that's right. And, um, and you know, the, there's so much research that talks about the ways that we're wired for connection. And so like we long for and need that connection, but the face to face connection is, you know, from my experience, although I have lots of digital relationships as ours is, um, it's the face to face. That's the kind of ultimately fulfilling kind of and sustaining experience. Um, not just the digital. Yeah. I think there's, um, uh, again, I don't want to be like a curmudgeon or anything, and I and I do think that there have been some some uses that have been incredibly fulfilling. But I I remember thinking about being fully disconnected on the Camino and thinking, well, I'm not going to know things like when I get back, <laughs> yeah. right? And uh-huh. uh, I, to be honest, that that I felt very uncomfortable hmm. with that prospect. But then I also know that. I don't want to assume one way or the other that my Camino would have been better if I left a phone at home or mm. turned off in my bag every day because there were use there were uses for that device on the Camino for translation and direction and things like that and yeah. um, you know obviously keeping connected with family but uh, there was a lot going on while we were walking politically here in the states obviously and you know we talked about like why is our life better that we know this like. <laughs> I can't do anything about this, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and it made me think about, well, you know, how does that apply when I return home? Yeah. Like, and I'm, I'm afraid to say things because I think it, I think it makes me sound like insensitive and like a privileged straight white guy. But I, I think like, just because something's news, does it, do I need to know it? Like, mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. it distracting me from things in my own community that I should, care more about because I can have an impact on those things. Mm -hmm. Is it robbing me of energy and a spirit to care about those things when all they do is sound like one more problem that I can't control. And in fact, maybe I can't, you know, so I don't know. I, 
I'm, um, and look, I'm still, on, I'm looking at Twitter two or three times a day, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, like, I mean, you know, the, the, this context, the two of us work in digital media all the time. <laughs> all the time. I mean, I'm teaching a class, I'm scheduled to teach that class again in 2019. I hope they don't hear this. I hope they don't hear this interview. <laughs> yeah, right. For the people yeah. buying my books. That's right. Um, yeah, I think, um, oh, man, what was I going to say? Because uh, you were just, um, I was thinking about uh, the stuff you were talking about. Um, but I think the Camino, the, the important, I know we're trying to maybe drifting away from the Camino, but I think as, as, an, as a practice and as an act that, you know, it's one of those unique places that allows you to have these kinds of conversations and to maybe change the way you talk or think about them yeah. because you're not in a position where you usually just unplug or yeah. uh, you're engaged with people from all walks of life and all over the world on a daily basis for a amount of time like that. Yeah. But you know, what I was going to say, um, I'll digress us again. Uh, what I was going to say was, I mean, I think I reached a point with um, just, kind of the overwhelming nature of the of news and people posting about it all the time and I really reached a point where in my for myself I had to say um, you know there's a sense of slacktivism like I'm just posting about things but what am I actually really doing about it um, and we're kind of living to your point like we're all sort of living the sort of global national story and um, as opposed to like and those are things like I have very little control over but I can get involved locally. So I decided like, I'm just gonna cut it out on social media and really deep dive into my local um, stuff here, you know, not just in my state, but in my township. And, um, and that yeah. was such a valuable shift for me because like, it's right here, it's daily life in the township. I've made a whole bunch more relationships with people, you know, by doing that rather than just posting about stuff or reading about stuff, like just setting that aside and really trying to figure out ways I can be involved right in my neighborhood. Yeah. A really, really good thing for me. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. I, I, I've been thinking about ways to do that because I, every, you know, every time I would get on social media, it would be, I would read the news article like mm -hmm. or a news article and like try to, you know, find a source that is somewhat like trustworthy and say, okay, this is, seems to be what's happening. <laughs> and then like the other 90 things, for example, are people's anger over that news article that I read that also made me angry. And yeah. I'm like, I, why, I don't, all I'm doing is getting more angry alongside these angry people. <laughs> right. And like, why, why does it make me, why does it make me angry mm -hmm. and anxious? And I felt like the more I would scroll, the higher my blood, blood pressure would go. Yeah. And I'm like, but I'm not responding to that hike in blood pressure is not responding to the article that I read. Mm. Hmm. Like See. the rest of that stuff's unhealthy. I don't need, like, I don't, I don't need that. So I can still stay plugged in and informed, but it's almost like the diet, right? Like I've got to, like, I got to follow two things and mute and mm. literally mute everything else. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it was, uh, and, and then I thought, because it is just, and I think it's designed that way. Hmm. I do. I think Facebook, Instagram, Twitter are, their algorithms are designed to, to feed that. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say there may be even more malicious intent behind it from, from advertisers hmm. and from news outlets hmm. that, uh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting off topic. Yeah. 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 But I mean, I, I, I think that's a hugely important, I don't think it's a, that's a digression at all because um, I mean, that's part of the Camino experience, but I mean, that's where, you know, we're in a reckoning period with digital media right now, you know, in yeah. so many ways. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it all started up and, and now it's, it's, there's a reckoning happening and we all need to reckon individually with it too. The nugget uh, that one of the many, many, many uh, uh, items that, I still wrestle with from the Sapiens book is, and I, and I'm, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but I can find them. But um, there's a, he, Harari has this line in the book that says the amount of time between the discovery of gunpowder, uh, the Chinese discovery of gunpowder, creation of gunpowder and the weaponization of that gunpowder was like hundreds of years, hmm. right? Hmm. Gunpowder just existed before it was ever thought to like use to kill people. 
Yeah. <laughs> we figured out uh, how to split the atom. And like 30 years later, we had the atomic bomb. Hmm. I, that's a problem. <laughs> that is, I am terrified. Like, and the ways in which we've discovered to be connected with the internet uh, and connect people all over, and it is being weaponized mm -hmm. against right. us. That's exactly. In, in a matter of a decade, right? Right. right. So I'm like, oh man, this is. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. Anyway, that's. Yeah. So so um so as a as a techie person and as a person of faith, like uh, I mean, which so we share a lot of that in common. That uh, I think that's kind of helpful to help prepare myself for you know, to kind of be thinking of that too. In some ways I was thinking about that question, you know, kind of on the specific small touch point of how do I share this experience with people? You know, how do I post it on Instagram? Um, but like that, that's kind of where we started kind of early on in the conversation. Yeah, that's true. But this yeah. is kind of like the bottom of the iceberg part of that discussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Pay no attention to the chaos behind the curtain. That's the, <laughs> right. Yeah, that, yeah, I, I think the ways in which you've captured, I mean, I've been really inspired by what you've done with uh, tech and with content that mm -hmm. I think is a good example of that, that we, I think uh, it has made a good impact. I would just to use a very uh, broad term, like it's made a positive impact. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it's a matter of just simply being more disciplined and using it for those purposes and engaging it for those purposes. Maybe, uh, yeah. maybe that's the solution, not, not necessarily throwing it all away. Yeah, the shift I made myself um, more recently was trying to differentiate between uh, not just reacting, but I think I would like mistake this time spent on social media generally interacting with something that was constructive, <laughs> like, because it was not always constructive. There's good things about being present. Yeah. But I, what I try to focus, what I've started to try to focus on more is, am I create, what am I creating? Like yeah. not just the interacting, but like what, if I, my, my time on digital stuff is better used generating or creating something as like a, that. just, just responding, reacting, interacting all the time and mistaking that for something that's more tangible or durable than it really turns out to be. When I was uh, on the rare occasions that we would like check in in the morning on social media or something while we were having breakfast and I would feel this urge to interact, hmm. I would just think that chorus does not need this voice. Like I don't need <laughs> to add my voice to that. And what is it that I, but what is it that I need to do or what is it that I should do? Hmm. And I don't know that at least on the journey, oftentimes it was just turn it off. Um, but now, you know, now that we're back, what do we, what what is it that I that can be done or should be done? So I think that's a little similar to being creative and proactive as opposed to I don't know, interactive. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Cool. Well, any um, well maybe we should wrap it up and uh, ask it, any final bits of advice you might have for a future pilgrim. <laughs> yeah, uh, invest in. Spare no expense for shoes and socks. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, and quick dry everything. Okay. Yes. Um, I had boots and very comfortable boots, but I think I would have, I think I would go uh, the trail runner mm. route um, mm -hmm. for shoes just for lightweight and um, padding. Right. So like the cushion of the sole. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's the real advice. Um, try to get some hikes in before you go. Mm. But you you run though, right? You're a runner. Yeah, I tend to run. Yeah, you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you'll I'm be fine. Ready, but um, I'm a runner and a walker. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know that I have any. I mean, that's it. And uh, do your dead level best to keep your pack around ten to twelve pounds. Okay. Um, that is crucial. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, that ten feels like twenty. Mm. um it just gets heavier as yeah. the day goes okay. um uh, yeah i would say people say 10 percent of your body weight oh, okay. i'd go even less okay. if possible um i took my phone i took my ipad because there would be some nights we would get in 
and we'd be like, Hey, let's just watch something. Let's, we got to zone out. Like, let's mm-hmm. just watch something on Netflix or yeah, something like we didn't feel like interacting. We we're just so tired. Yeah. Um, and, but that's a personal preference. I mean, our phone, my phone was on all day, every day. Mm-hmm. Um, but the time difference was such that I wasn't getting a lot of texts all right. and people knew people knew that we were gone. So that was helpful, but yeah. it, it did come in handy for directions for recommendations about where to stay mm. um, for, and I guess, you know, people could critique that and say, Oh, you should be more adventurous. But you know, at the end of the day, like being able to have a place booked and to know where I was going to walk to and take a shower. And yeah. Eat, <laughs> yeah. That was a huge lift. Like it was a boost to say, Oh, I've only got five more K to go or, yeah, you know, we've got, this is saying we're about an hour out. Like that was mentally a huge help. And, um, yeah, I think that's cool. as far as eat the pilgrim meals, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, drink the house wine. <laughs> um, I'm jealous cause I hear, I hear the food in Portugal is amazing. Um, uh-huh. I hear good things too. Yeah. 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 So I think we'll do that one next. I think. Cool. Well then I can return the favor. And I could tell you about my experience. No, I can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> Your whole trip is going to be, is going to be really amazing. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think there's like, there's, we, what we can kind of imagine or anticipate is probably, you know, not even a quarter of what it's actually going to be when it happens. So what's the date that you're going to walk? I'm going to walk, I think it's June 5th to June 18th or something like that. So you'll have warmer days. We, mm-hmm. we were very lucky with our weather and we had no rain and it was never warmer than 80 degrees. Nice. So I would, and I've heard from people who've walked it multiple times who walk in the summer. Um, and you probably read this in other places, but like walk as much as you can, as early as you can. Yeah. There were some people we had heard, you know, they would say, Oh, we got up at like 4 AM and wow. walk in the dark but your problem the problem there is right you're you're not seeing as much as you would in the daylight so it's kind of a trade-off between warmer temperatures and actually yeah. seeing where you're walking and yeah but maybe if you get moving at daybreak you can avoid most of the heat yeah 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 cool well ryan thank you so much this was awesome it was great yeah to and great yeah for the way our paths keep intersecting yeah. Yeah. Well, safe travels when you get ready to go. And um, if there's any other questions, you can always hit me up. But I think it's going to be wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks.